Hello and welcome to the Angerati studio here at African Utility Week. I'm uh, joined now by David Sharp Jones, who's the co-founder of Seesaw. And uh, David, we were talking off air a little bit uh, about uh, some of the uh, challenges you're trying to uh, fill. Just to contextualize it, you're, 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 you're predominantly working in the water and sanitization business. And uh, you've taken this crazy step of launching this, co-founding this company, launching it, you're a year and a half in. Um, the obvious question, obviously, which anybody asks any startup, what's the problem you're trying to solve? Yeah, thanks, Adam. Um, well, as you say, we're working in water and sanitation, and uh, Seesaw is based here in Cape Town in, in South Africa, and South Africa is one of the 30 driest countries in the world. So uh, we had the Minister for Water uh, here in this conference centre a couple of months ago launch a, a big study on the South African water sector, and uh, we're losing more than a third of the water that, that goes into the water treatment systems, and that's putting a lot of strain on the environment. And it's also meaning there's less water left over in the system for the extremities, which turn out to be the informal settlements and, and the poor areas. So Seesaw has been basically set up to, to try and address that problem and, and try and see if we can use new technology some of this hype about smartphones and Google Maps to, to address that, whether to save water for financial reasons or to protect the environment. Mm. And, uh, and you say a third of the water is being lost as part of the sanitization process. Do you have any idea where that's going? Or, or, or is that the million dollar question? Yeah, well, I mean, the technical term for it's non-revenue water. Uh, right. So that's water that didn't get paid for. Right. Okay. Um, so, so it's not actually actually lost. It's well, just it's not being paid for. It's not for. paid for. So right. it could be not paid for for a couple of reasons. Either mm. it did get lost, right. it leaked out through leaks in, in pipes, yeah. or actually somebody did use it and, and, and didn't pay for it. And so uh, from the municipality's point of view, it's almost the same thing. It's water that they uh, pumped uphill, that they filtered, that they cleaned, that they, they sent out in their system, and then they didn't get paid for. Obviously, for, from the view of NGOs and the environment, it, it can be a slightly different thing. But uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's a third. It's, uh, by world scales, it's, it's more or less at the average. But bear in mind that the study was only from the half of the good municipalities who gave the figures. And the suspicion is the ones who didn't give any figures. Are, it could be much higher. Yeah, exactly. Right, OK. And, uh, uh, and, and clearly, I mean, I, I see it. It's the first time I'm in Cape Town. I see lots of signs about, you know, our water is scarce. Use it. It's a big, big issue. Yeah. It's Actually, if you think about it, it's a big global issue as well, but we're here, let's tackle this for, uh, for starters. Uh, with, uh, with Seesaw, uh, how do you hope to actually solve that problem? Yeah. Uh, okay, so, I mean, there's a couple of things. There's the fact that there's off-reported statistic that more people have mobile phones than have toilets, uh, and increasingly we're looking at more mobile phones than, than people. Um, people are having more than one mobile phone or SIM cards are everywhere. Mm -hmm. So we're saying, okay, how can we use that ability to send information cheaply uh, and easily and increasingly take things like photos and send those too? Mm -hmm. And how can we use that to do one of two things? Either we get the providers of water, whether it's municipalities or governments, to be more efficient by using their own staff, or we get members of the general public to play a role and tell us when they see a major leak, tell us when there's instances of river pollution, or just re report when they feel there's an issue with their bill, because that sort of information is not currently getting through at the moment. So it's a little bit like, um, uh, uh, to draw an analogy, the, 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 there's an app, uh, I think it was launched in New York, where they actually crowdsour crowdsourced reporting of potholes in roads, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. th that actually gave the municipality better reporting about where issues were and what they needed. Is, is it a similar sort of idea, uh, or am I being too simplistic? No, there? yeah, so there's there's a couple of things internationally. There's one called See, Click, Fix. Where, you know, you see it, you click, and it gets fixed. Fix. That's the American one, and mm. Fix My Street mm. is the UK that's version. That's the one, yeah. That's yeah. Right, yeah. So for fixing potholes, and I think a lot of the attention so far is, is in that. How can you get the general public to, to report a problem? Now, to be frank with you, that works better in the States or in the UK because you report a problem there and you've got, you know, your, your council or whatever is, is likely to come and fix it. Uh, Seesaw, we work in predominantly in Africa and that's not necessarily what happens. So we're tending to focus less on the public reporting problems and more on, okay, who is the person who's going to fix that problem? How do we get them to be more responsive, more efficient in the first place? And then if we're going to get the crowdsourced information from the public, we make sure that there's someone going to actually respond to it. 
because that's the, the biggest thing that disengages crowds is when they're doing their bit and actually, you know what, I've taken 20 pictures of this leak now, it's still not fixed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and actually, I mean, you get to the nub of why myself and a couple of other guys got involved in Seesaw. I mean, two of us are, are non-techies. We're water and sanitation engineers. Uh, and we've been working a lot on, on reforming the, in, in Africa, whether it's governments or regulators or, or utilities. But, um, but there's a lot of people jumping in there with a techie background saying, OK, look how easy it is for guys to just send a photo through. And, and we're just concerned that there'll be a lot of hype about this. People will send through their photos, send their text messages. Nothing will happen. Mm. And when you go back to them in five years' time and say, OK, look, look what the opportunity is. They're like, no, no, we, we heard all about that cell phone stuff. It doesn't work. Mm. So, so though we, we've clubbed together with techies, and the idea is if you put the two groups together, you get a, a better impression of what's actually going to work in a place like Madagascar mm. or Maputo or mm. Sutu. Because mm. it, it, it seems to me what you say is that the fundamental problem that needs to get cracked first is that the people who are in charge of delivering the water, getting skills in there and, and, uh, and knowledge in there to actually do something about it. And what are the challenges on that side? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're the challenges that, that we've been familiar with for, for a long time. I mean, it's, it's capacity and, and incentives. And so one of the, I think, the advantages of, of where we are now, as opposed to 10 years ago, is because there's more information, people like the regulator has more information about what's working and what's not. It's easier to figure out how much is being lost in leaks. And then you can turn around, you can put pressure on utility managers, and, and you can look at, okay, what are their incentives to improve? And you can reward them for good performance. So you mix that kind of dynamic up with the ability for the, the public or enlightened NGOs or others to send to information. You're starting to get positive incentives to, to, to improve the leaks, to improve the service. Mm -hmm. Whereas before, I think we were operating in a, in a black hole where information was written down on paper, stored on files, never seen again, uh, and everything became very subjective and there wasn't that push for better performance. It, be it becomes incredibly hard to mine that data if it's in filing cabinets and stuff like that. You just can't get it out ag uh, in an agile way, can you? Um, so one of the other questions I want to ask you, you're, you know, you're clearly at this event. You, 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 you've probably been enjoying some of the presentations and everything. What are some of the things that you personally say, oh, well, it's great that we're talking about this, or, or, or this, is a, uh, this is a new thing mm -hmm. that I, I didn't know it existed. Uh, what are some of those takeaways for you? Yeah, look, I think um, this event's interesting in the sense that uh, it brings together the, the water sector with, with energy. Um, or with uh, hydropower and others. And, and you start to see what other sectors are doing and, and where they might be. For instance, the energy sector is very into smart meters, this ability to send the information sort of remotely and wirelessly. Uh, the water sector is a slightly different animal. Um, the need for that information is maybe different, but also mixing water and power makes it a, a bit harder to, to have those smart meters. But you see where the general trend is. And then you see an organization like IBM entering the fray with their smart cities and mm. smart water initiative. And you start to get a taste for, for where organizations that have maybe had an impact in, in North America or in, in the EU are coming down to Africa and saying, okay, how, how can we adapt what we have that's maybe very sophisticated, including these smart meters, and take it to a, to a Nairobi or to a Dar es Salaam. Um, so I think, yeah, that, that's an interesting dialogue. Mm -hmm. and, in, and sometimes the Nairobi's and Dar es Salaam's are actually further ahead in some things. People are adopting smartphones. Uh, the ANC was in, uh, organizing funerals by text message when, uh, when I moved here mm -hmm. 10 years ago. And so you see that is their ability to make the technological leap, perhaps, by using these phones. Mm -hmm. But the, the interplay between the different sectors is what I find interesting. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and do you think that uh, some of the, uh, I mean, you mentioned IBM um, with the yeah, you know, smart everything almost uh, yeah. uh, initiative uh, is do you th do you think they arrive in, in, into environments like this and uh, and this is not it's not just Africa you know you, South America you've got very similar dynamics sometimes mm -hmm. do you think they arrive and they get it or do they just come here to try and sell technology yeah that's a bit of a tough question um, yeah, look, I think there is an element of, of, of what you say. They're, they're to, you know, these technologies have been developed. The development costs have been paid for. Mm. They've been sold in Hamburg, uh, in New York, etc. And they come here, and, and again, it's uh, 
it's a, it's a nice way to get a bit of extra mileage out of the system you've already developed. So I think uh, where Seesaw are coming at it from is we're trying to work to start with, with, with these type of developing country contexts and say, okay, what system, you know, without any legacy systems, mm. what makes sense from where we are now in 2013? Uh, and, and yet, you know, they've got the big firepower. We don't. It'll be interesting to see, see how both we evolve and then how they evolve down the line. Well, that's an uh, interesting dynamic because when almost sometimes when there is no legacy, you can jump technology mm -hmm. and the mobile phone space, for which you mentioned just then, is one. You know, w why dig up all the roads if you can now get reasonable internet and everything on. You know, there's people in, in Kenya looking at trading prices and stock prices uh, for for goods. Farmers, I was reading about. You know, uh, so there's a potential to leapfrog, and uh, yeah. So I, 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 I wish you luck in your journey, yeah, and uh, you. uh, I hope you that uh, you know you could potentially put something together that uh, someone with a bit of legacy maybe wouldn't see. So uh, yeah. thank you for joining us in okay, the studio, great, and thank, uh, you. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for watching and um, more interviews on uh, Engerati. Uh, you can search through over 680 presentations now on, the smart, uh, on smart Energy. Uh, we hope you enjoy watching this interview and others, and we look forward to seeing you back on the site soon.